Now sit back, relax, and please welcome to the stage, John. tell teenagers that they think they're invincible. And in my experience, that wasn't true. I was very cautious as a teenager. But I can tell you that I spent every goddamn day since finishing college learning that a four-year college degree does not render you impervious to physical harm. <laughs> <laughs> Which is an easy way to say that I wasted four years of my life. <laughs> Last month, I burnt my thumb very badly, playing with fireworks in a drainage tunnel in Tinley Town. <laughs> and just last night, I burnt my index finger, lighting off a makeshift flamethrower I made out of a spray paint can and a lighter <laughs> that was passing in the woods in Arlington, Virginia. <clears throat> it's been a weird year for me. <laughs> The first thing I did this year was make four New Year's resolutions, and I kept three of them, which is pretty good. 75% is a C. <laughs> <laughs> One of my New Year's resolutions was that in the year 2016, I wasn't going to shit my pants. <laughs> February 10th. <laughs> <laughs> to get any protein in my day, I ate four handfuls of hummus with my hand <laughs> and drank an entire cup of black coffee and then ran two and a half miles to campus <laughs> to take a class taught by a man who worked for the FBI for 30 years and he did not notice that there was shit in my pants the whole time. <laughs> it's been a really weird year for me. <laughs> Earlier this year, a friend of mine's older sister in casual conversation forgot my name and described me as, you know, that guy, uh, your sad friend who used to be fat. <laughs> and that's maybe the second least flattering way I've ever been described. <laughs> but it's perhaps the most accurate. <laughs> so I'm willing to discuss it on stage. Because she's right, I did used to be fat. Now I just like to say, for any fat dudes in the audience, if you're really confused, you're wondering why you're not getting laid, you're wondering if it's because you're fat, or because you're sad, or because you're mean all the time, or because you don't talk to people, it's just because you're fat. <laughs> That's the only reason everything else is super negotiable. <laughs> you know that making fat person jokes when you used to be fat is the comedy equivalent of saying that you have black friends, but <laughs> I used to be fat. <laughs> so earlier this year I had to kiss somebody for the first time in like three years. I used to be fat. Um, <laughs> and it turns out, while you're going in for that kiss, you think to yourself a lot of thoughts. A lot of thoughts race very quickly through your brain. And chief among them is, I'm going to remember how to do this. This is going to be just like riding a bicycle. <laughs> and then your lips meet, and you realize that it's not like riding a bicycle. <laughs> And then you don't get a second date with that girl. <laughs> and then a month later, you've been dwelling on that. You've been thinking about how this whole time you thought kissing would just be like riding a bicycle with your mouth. <laughs> but you realize that you got to make a lot of adjustments in your life. And you start trying to ride a bicycle again to keep that weight off so that maybe you can get a second date in the future. <laughs> and moments <laughs> into riding a bicycle, you realize Riding a bicycle is not like riding a bicycle. <laughs> it's a lot like kissing somebody, but with your feet. <laughs> I didn't plan for that, this show that much. I worked eight hours, I finished working at seven, and then I ran over here. <laughs> I 
feel like I'm drinking too much seltzer. <laughs> and you guys are looking at me weird, but I'm so thirsty. <laughs> I'm so thirsty. And I've been doing different things in my life this year. I eventually got second dates with people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was intended as condescending, but I want you to know I read it as condescending. <laughs> so I, um, I was having sex with a person. And afterwards, she said, you know, this is maybe a weird thing to say, but you've actually got kind of a big dick. <laughs> that is, that, you're right, that's a weird thing to say. Because I'd never heard someone qualify that kind of sentence before. <laughs> and it was a level of seemingly honest behavior that I wasn't expecting from that. Because <laughs> you know if someone says you have a big dick, that it means you have a small dick, because they wouldn't say it if you had a big dick, right? But I don't know what kind of dick means. So I was really, that I internalized that in a weird way, and I, I was talking to a close friend of mine about it. And I said, yeah, this girl said I had kind of a big dick. I thought that was weird. And my friend said, that is really weird. And I said, yeah, because why would you qualify that sentence, right? My friend said, no, oh. That's not why I thought that was weird. And I said, what? <laughs> I said, we've been friends for several years at this point. I said, um, I thought that was weird. Because the whole time I've known you, really, just from like the first introduction, I've assumed you had like an abnormally small and misshapen penis. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> and they said, just, you know, no one with even normal genitals would carry themselves like you do. <laughs> I've seen you in your personal life. I've seen you on stage. Nobody with even the normal amount of confidence in their body would possibly act like that. <laughs> That's probably the least flattering thing anyone's ever said about <laughs> But also maybe the most accurate. <laughs> I hurt my back really badly two weeks ago, but I was really committed to opening this show with a pratfall. <laughs> I'm starting to realize that may have been an error on my part. <laughs> if anyone knows a good masseuse, talk to me. Not right now. I'm a little, I'm a little busy at the moment. And not right after me, because there's another guy, and that'd be rude. But like, after the show. <laughs> Probably the worst thing that happened to me this year, including the time that a man called me the N-word. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna get to that later. But probably the worst thing that happened to me this year was uh, I was at a party. I had hosted a big comedy show and I was at a party. It was an after party for the show. A man who I didn't know with a mustache <laughs> red flag right there. <laughs> a man that I didn't know with a mustache walked up to me and said, you're that guy from that show. And I was like, yeah, this is that party from that show. <laughs> he said, you're trying to collect unusual life experiences. And I said, yeah, you're right. That was the 15 minute closer for that show. <laughs> I'm glad you could remember it for about 20 minutes. That's sick, I'm so happy for you. And then he said, do you wanna see a photograph on my phone my girlfriend's new labia piercing. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then he showed me a photograph. Can you guess what it was of? His girlfriend's new labia piercing. You got it! Yeah. And also, I got someone else to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uncomfortable saying the word labia more than once in an act, and I just noticed that I did it. <laughs> <laughs> So based off of that experience, I think it's incredibly important that we, as a society, all get on board with reintroducing sex negativity. <laughs> sex positivity was a cute idea, and I was on board for it too. We all were. Because it's like, you should be able to have sex with people and feel good about it. That's cool. That's why you do that, right? 
Uh, but what happened with the sex positivity movement is that um, everyone still called girls sluts all the time, and dudes with mustaches thought it was okay to act way worse than they used to. <laughs> it made you like a fake liberal, a fake progressive, if you called them out on their bad behavior because you were being sex negative. Hell yeah, I'm being sex negative. You're gross. <laughs> I was in an STD clinic earlier this year. I don't have AIDS, just really bad anxiety. But I'm responsible, you should get tested, you know? <laughs> and um, there was this guy who walked out and he had a sleeve all rolled up. And you could see he had a bandage right here from where a nurse had just drawn blood, you know, to see if he had AIDS. <laughs> and he walked out into the lobby. And he sat next to this girl. <laughs> you wanna, you wanna grab some food after this? <laughs> <laughs> and that really upset me. That shook me to my core, to be quite honest. <laughs> uh, and I was thinking about it for a really, really long time. Why? Oh, why? That's the worst place to pick up chicks, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that I wasn't thinking the right way about it. <laughs> That's the only room on Earth where you know that everyone else there has irresponsible sex with people they don't know that well. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the best place to pick up chicks. <laughs> if you also really like to gamble. <laughs> As of yesterday, I no longer live with a white supremacist, but it was a hairy couple of months. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't pick my white supremacist roommate by choice. It wasn't something I intended to do. It wasn't something I meant to do. It's just something that happened to me. Uh, but my Craigslist roommate <laughs> turned out to be a white supremacist. And it sneaks up on you. You don't want to just assume that about a person, or at least I didn't. So like, you know, when I knocked on his door, 3 a.m. to tell him to turn his music down because I had work at 8 a.m. and he opened the door and called me the n-word and closed the door. I thought maybe he's just a guy who doesn't know what words mean. <laughs> Use them with, cause like. <laughs> like... <laughs> so I wasn't super sold on the white supremacy train just yet, but then. Um, during the first presidential debate, he yelled at his television really loudly, loud enough that I could hear it from a separate room in the house, uh, fuck black lives. And I was like, oh, this guy's got some sketchy politics. <laughs> I don't know if I agree with him on a lot of issues that I'd like to agree with a, someone that I have to share a kitchen with. <laughs> the first day after Trump won the election, I had to clean up a white supremacist's vomit. That's the first thing I did. <laughs> oh, sweat there. I wonder how that got there. Um, you learn a lot about yourself when you live with a white supremacist. Um, you learn a lot about white supremacy as a movement. Because you think that those are all like inhuman monsters, which is true. But what's way scarier is that they're just regular human monsters. So like, <laughs> this, he, he would get blackout drunk a lot and play music really loudly, loud enough that I could hear it from my room, which was a separate room. And I would usually put on earplugs and then also put on headphones over the earplugs to try to cancel it out which I think has been bad for my hearing overall. <laughs> but 
usually little bits and pieces of whatever he was listening to would still get in there. They'd still wiggle their way in. So one time, <laughs> I heard him singing along really passionately. And I was like, is that? Huh. I took off the headphones. And I took off the earplugs. <laughs> and I went to my door. I got and he was singing along to Smash Mouth's All Star. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. So I decided to keep off, keep all the hearing stuff out and listen for a while longer still. Then the next song came on and it was Smash Mouth again, this time covering the monkeys, I'm a believer. And I sat there and I was like, huh. Oh. He kept singing along really passionately to each song and I kept Googling lyrics and snippets of each song to go like, is this? And I realized that he was singing along track by track to every single song from the Shrek's original. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized something that day about racists. <laughs> They've got layers. <laughs> Like an onion. <laughs> it is a great pleasure of mine to get to intro this next time. And I asked him what he wanted me to intro with, me, him with, and he said, well, you used to intro me with this one story, but we decided to retire that. And I was like, that's true. I wanted to intro with this story. And he said, my godparents will be in the audience. You can't intro me with that story. <laughs> As I alluded to earlier, I am a man who has a college degree from this very university. And the day before, I had to get on my cap and gown and walk to, uh, to campus to get my degree, proving that I did it. I got a text from a man that said, hey, we're drinking champagne tonight. <laughs> I said, cool. And I showed up at a man's house and I drank at least one bottle of champagne. <laughs> but I know I brought three to the party. And I know that I didn't leave with any. So I don't know quite where it ended up, but somewhere in that range. And I remember at some point in this party, <coughs> talking to this man and saying, Sir, this is like the last night of us in college together. And he said, I have to do another semester. And I said, fuck you. <laughs> this is our last night of college together. And he said, yeah. And then I was like, put that cigarette out of my ass right now. And he said, what? <laughs> I said, you have to do it. <laughs> and then the next morning, when I was throwing up <laughs> in my bathroom, without a great memory of how I got back home, <laughs> I felt a pain. I turned around and I looked in the mirror. And I know I asked about one cigarette, but I woke up with two cigarette burns on my right ass cheek that are still scarred there to this day. <laughs> Left there by Mr. <coughs> Eric Berenger. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Eric Berenger. 